Hello, everyone. So while we settle in, I want to ask who in the room has been to a WNBA game? Raise your hands. Let's go. OK, awesome. And then who has been to an NWSL game? OK, we've got to get some more people <laughs> to, soccer, to soccer games. But great, great to know. So Sue, would love to start with you. You've been in women's professional basketball for more than two decades, and you have a view into other sports as well. So when you look at the craziness, the attention of the past year, good and bad, how different was this year compared to what you've seen earlier in your career and even just a couple years ago? Oh, uh, incredibly different, entirely different. Um, when I think back on probably the last five years or so, we've really seen a shift. I think it does start with women's soccer and their fight for equal pay. That really put a lot of these conversations on the map. That's why you should be going to NWSL games. <laughs> um, and then we look at the WNBA's bubble season, 2020. I think that started putting us in different conversations. You fast forward now, the, the platform was built, and then we had this rookie class, especially in the WNBA, come in, but younger players in soccer as well, come in, and they've got flair, they've got personality, they've got, they've got followings because of NIL. Boom. Yeah, amazing. And NIL, for anyone who doesn't know, is the reform in college sports allowing college athletes to earn money. Oh, yeah, my bad. Yes. So, Clara, thank you so much for being here because your team is in the finals right now yeah. between game two and three. <laughs> so I don't know, we have a lot of New Yorkers in the room, so we might be rooting for the Liberty. But um, I would love to hear a little bit from you about what has been driving this growth. You know, a lot of people are likely familiar with the rookie class, like Sue mentioned, and Caitlin Clark and her popularity, but there are a lot of other factors. So could you tell us a little bit about what's behind this growth from a yeah. fan and business perspective? Right. Well, I think what's really driven the growth is a very compelling and exciting product, which of course starts with the incredible basketball excellence on the floor. If you've gone, you've seen that it's physical and it's gritty, it's super competitive. Um, so it starts with that, but it's also um, now complemented by a really great um, game day experience. And for us, if you've been to a Liberty game, you've seen the time, Timeless Torches and you've seen Ellie. And so all in all, I think what's driven a lot of fans to us is not just the game, which is really why everyone's there, but also the wraparound wall-to-wall -wall entertainment that we have around that. Secondly, I think um, the star power, definitely. Um, the spiciness of Angel and Caitlin and that sort of rivalry um, you know, has brought a lot of attention. And then thirdly, I would say the mainstream media coverage. It's mainstream media coverage who followed uh, these college stars when they were in college. And um, you know, being able, that and the social media and the virality of social media allowed some of these stars to be household names before they even got to the draft. And for the first time, we were able to take that fan base from college basketball right into the pros. And I think that made a big difference for us. Totally. Um, Michelle, so you have a global view into sports, um, especially soccer and, or football in the US, UK, and France. So are we seeing the same women's sports trends globally? Um, what's the same across markets and what's different? Yeah, I mean, I think th this is definitely a global trend. I think that uh, football or soccer is probably the, the biggest sport uh, globally. Um, something like six billion out of eight billion either played or mo watch. So I think that actually the women's uh, uh, football is growing everywhere, France, England, especially Spain, uh, even in Lyon where I have a team. Um, I took it over about a year ago. Um, it was probably a couple thousand, but now we actually have 40,000. The Champions League final game in Bilbao uh, last May, we had over 50,000 almost sold out at a stadium. So it is a global trend, and it's, not, it's, it's out of the back. It's not going to stop. Yeah. And you have talked about how you came to sports. You know, a lot of people come to sports ownership in a way as some sort of passion project, whether they grew up playing sports or it's just emotional and meaningful for them. You've basically said this is a business opportunity. So, how did you identify that? What numbers did you see that led you to that conclusion? Yeah, so I think that initially, I mean, I didn't play soccer. I was not a fan. I didn't know who Leo Messi was. So, I was really totally new <laughs> to sports. So, but I think I got involved for the equal pay, the, the whole cleaning up the scandal and everything else from that perspective. But in the process, I became very passionate. And I was actually very surprised um, seeing the potential that it, there hasn't been the kind of investment that I expected. So what I saw where it was and where it could be, it could go, that, that gap was really huge. But that wasn't going to happen just because we're women's sports, come and watch. But rather, it has to be taken seriously as an entertainment product. We're not just competing against men's sports. We are competing against other forms of entertainment. We all have seven evenings a week. 
And it is not just the sports games, but it is going to a movie, going to Taylor Swift concert, or going out to dinner. So what's our value proposition? As Clara said, um, it, we have to put out really the best product, compelling reason for our fans to come to 13 uh, weekends or even more. So I, I think that the, the investment was ne absolutely necessary to put the best product and be the most compelling entertainment product, and we're getting there. Yeah. So for a variety of complex reasons, you know, the surge in viewership and attendance doesn't necessarily translate to much more money for athletes immediately, at least from their actual salaries rather than other opportunities. So Sue, how does that disparity affect players in the meantime and what can be done by owners, sponsors, other stakeholders while we wait? Um, well, I mean, the good news is I think for both leagues, we've signed massive media deals. So the money is around the corner. So that's, that's really exciting for a long time. A lot of us had to play overseas, um, but really recently you've been able to make money off the court. And that's actually what was so, um, from a player standpoint, so confusing. I was like, wait, I'm only getting paid, you know, in, in some of my, my later years after the new CBA was signed, I did get to make in the 200, you know, $250,000 range, which was wonderful. But um, for a large portion of my career, I was stuck at like 100, 110. For, for pre I pretty much lost money playing in the WNBA, if I'm being honest. <laughs> like, if you look at, like, inflation and stuff. So it was really confusing because I was getting offered crazy deals off the court from a marketing standpoint, representing brands, maybe going to do a speaking engagement. And that's really, for me, that disconnect, I knew we had something. I knew that the players were in the community. I knew that the players had value, even outside of being basketball players. But why weren't we we're being valued as a player? Um, so the good news is, all of us, I mean, I'm retired now, but a lot of the players, we learned how to be our own businesses. We understood what it was to, to create our own brands. And, and now you're getting a really dynamic athlete that brands get to work with. And that's really when I talk to different brands what I push. And, and, and athletes are ready for it. But yeah, the media deal's here now, so it's all gonna change. Yeah, and we have a lot of those big business decision makers in the room. And you know, a recent report found, found that 6% of the Fortune 500 sponsors women's sports compared to 20% for comparable men's sports, so that does not even include the NFL. So what opportunities are businesses still missing? And when they do engage in women's sports, what do they get out of it and who can they reach? Right. Clara, maybe if you have yeah. thoughts. Yeah, well, I think that there's, well, first of all, you know, I think there's a lot of room for, I mean, you know, if, if I could say what I think industry leaders can do to help us is I think that you know, be season ticket holders, um, you know, be, buy suites, entertain at women's sports events the same way you entertain at men's sports events, and talk about it, be vocal about it, because actually I think your employees will take a lot of pride in that. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've come a long way, but um, we can definitely still do better because advertisers still don't think about women's sports the same way that they think about men's sports. Um, but I do want to talk about two partnerships that we recently did that were first of its kind and maybe indicative of what's coming. One is the Off-White Partnership. Um, it's a luxury lifestyle brand um, which has never really ever invested in a US sports brand and they chose to come in to the US market through, through a women's team. And I think we just had great uh, brand alignment and they wanted to be disruptive and that they wanted to come in through women's sports and work through sports and culture. So that is a cash investment. And then the second investment we've done was with a company um, called, um, um, well, Xbox, right, who wanted to use the Liberty brand to help promote their video collaborations, first with Roblox and then with Sea of Thieves. And um, we did three different custom courts uh, for them. And again, a very unusual way to work together, but it involved cash and it, it was brand alignment and just, um, you know, first of its kind again for um, any sports league. Yeah, really innovative. And I'll come to everyone for questions in a moment, so start thinking if you have any. But we've been talking about basketball and soccer, but Michelle, you've also announced a, I believe, $4 million donation into women's rugby. What potential do you see there? That was the most expensive game I've ever attended. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was at the Olympic, of course, for the women's uh, soccer uh, team and so forth, and I was invited to the rugby game. I've seen rugby games, but not women's, especially not the, the rugby sevens. And when I walked into the stadium, I was just really, really shocked that it was sold out. And actually, quite frankly, women's football was not sold out. It was near sold out, but it wasn't sold out. So it's the, the rugby was sold out. It was something like 70,000. And I sat next to the US rugby uh, chairman and so forth. I started chatting. 
And actually what I found out was that rugby right now, women's rugby in the US is about the same place where women's soccer was about, I would say four or five years ago. And by looking at just the, the, the stadium, the fans and the excitement, um, just very, very similar. They're just three, four years uh, behind us. And I think there's an incredible potential. So I just wanted to do just little to nudge to move to, to that direction. So I did say it was the conditional that they have to win the gold medal in LA. And when they do, I want one too. Wow. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, do we have any questions for any of our panelists? Oh, one over there. Um, and microphone is coming your way. Hi, ladies. Thank you. I'm Natasha Galavoti, president of uh, Bimbo uh, Bread Company and also a Division I athlete. There's quite a bit of activity right now um, with name, image, and likeness for college athletes. And pro sports are because of the amateur pipeline that uh, college athletes have been able to have an experience. Any perspective on the potential of non-revenue sports, which are not women's basketball, but could be rugby, lacrosse, other sports, and making sure that while the power and funding goes to athletes, there's still the ability uh, to get that talent at the collegiate level so that we can continue to have as many sports and women participating in the Olympics. Yeah, I don't know who wants to take that one. I, I mean, I'm a bit, I love NIL because NIL, name, image, and likeness for college athletes, this impacts women, I think, more than, than, than men. Um, it gives us the ability to, to use our college moment and that platform, because let's be honest, NCAA tournaments, no matter what sport you're talking about, are big. People tune in, they watch. And so to, to give the athlete the opportunity to benefit, benefit off that and, and again, create that brand, I think does help. You know, I can, I, obviously I can mostly speak to basketball, the impact of NIL, I really believe, in five to 10 years is going to be written about and how it, how it changed things for our league. So my only hope is that it does maybe for, for rugby players, for other sports. Um, and, and to really actually answer the last question you're asking, I think another reason why brands do need to get involved, another reason why the investment still needs to come from cor corporate pro partnership is it's a known thing. I mean, you just said you're a D1 athlete, right? It's a known thing that when you participate in sports, a lot of CEOs are birds from that for women. There's something there. And so I think for companies to back women's sports, we always talk about inspiration, but aspiration plays a role as well. And, and when those two combined, I think what you get left with is, yes, yeah, some really incredible athletes that might become pro, but also a lot of the people sitting in this room right now that become CEOs. So I think it, it just all interacts, and, and NIL plays a big role in that. Totally. I think we have another question back here. Hi, Zoe Weintraub from Guild. Um, Dovetailing off of your kind of comment, Sue, um, we supported the Olympics in this last um, games as the official education, skilling, and career partner. So we supported athletes to be able to have the opportunity to think about transition out of sport um, so that for the first time, our Team USA athletes can go back to school or learn a new skill and think about what is that pivotal moment when they transition. And so my question kind of comes from what you said and what you said um, in terms of kind of thinking about athletes in a different way. We have a room full of executives and leaders that sit and think about large workforce decisions. Like, what are some pieces of feedback or advice you'd think about giving to this room about considering hiring athletes, women specifically, but just looking for that? I mean, it's its own skill, and we've been talking a lot about skills-based hiring. Um, how can we think differently um, and really lift up those, those individuals? Yeah, I mean, I... The things I learn by playing sports, I'm learning, I'm realizing now. Um, I often joke, you know, I retired when I was 41. I was really old. <laughs> I was, my age was talked about all the time. And yeah, in my field, I was old. And now all of a sudden, I'm in the real world, and I'm young again. But I have the, <laughs> I know, it's crazy. But that's literally how I feel. Um, although I turned 44 soon, so I'm getting up there. No, I'm um, but I realized, like, oh my god, I have a skill set that I've literally been working on. I started playing sports when I was in like, oh God, who even knows, like first, second grade. So I've literally, whether it's teamwork, goal setting, discipline, how to work with others. Sometimes I joke, I'm like, oh man, if the country was ran the way sports teams are ran, like we'd be in a better place because we, we just have an understanding of what it is to interact with each other and every athlete has this skill set, without a doubt. Now are some better at some things than others? Of course. But every athlete has that in them. I mean, I could go on and on about the skills that, again, I feel like I woke up when I retired and I was really, oh, I can walk into these different rooms 
and I can actually have a voice because what I'm bringing to the table is a little bit different because of my sports background. Yeah, amazing. I think we have one question back there. Hi, uh, Daniel Croucher, Elixir. Um, I feel like the US has a once in a generation opportunity. In the next 10 years, you guys will host the Soccer World Cup, the LA 28 Olympics, the, Paralymp uh, the Paralympics, um, the Winter Olympics in Utah, the Cricket World Cup, et cetera. So how do you feel like you guys are going to utilize this opportunity? Um, I feel like sports is one of the only things that brings the world together these days. It's a huge opportunity. So curious of your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, Clara, Michelle, any plans? Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, we're just focused on um, continuing, I mean, you know, I, you know, continuing to promote, you know, U.S. basketball. Now, we're, of course, we haven't lost in how many years? Too many to count. Yeah, I, okay. since 1992. So, so, yeah, but, you know, I, I will <laughs> chime in here and say that I do believe that this is definitely a way to get more eyeballs onto women's sports, so... I think it is important to, of course, field a team that can win, but also have people on the roster uh, that will really bring um, new fans. Because I will say, in order to sustain the growth that we're seeing, we need to broaden our reach. We need to attract new fans. And fandom you know, definitely comes from marketing your stars. So I think, actually, in the football, um, if you look at, actually, soccer in the US, uh, how do you get attention? Actually, a significant portion of the population, U.S. population, actually identify these sports with the National Olympic or World Cup kind of events. That's really the fastest way to bring awareness. A lot of people are aware, but they're not aware that we have a professional league uh, in the football soccer world. So um, the, the study after study actually proved that that was the case. So it's actually part of what we're trying to do. All our players are actually playing in those games. So in 2019, the World Cup, women won. And right after that, the US uh, NWSL had a significant uh, uh, push to, to um, increasing the, the fan base. Even the, the uh, Washington Spirit, I think, sold out right after because Rose Lavelle uh, played. Unfortunately, the COVID happened. And now the Olympic, the World Cup, I think that will continue to bring the awareness. And then we're going to have to tie our efforts through the players and through the national games have to tie to the fact that we have actually very vibrant and incredible national um, professional leagues. And I think it's going to be very helpful. Can I add to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that um, I think the beauty of having all of those main events in the US, and this doesn't just go for US athletes, it's really all athletes, particularly women. We have, as athletes, we have microphones in front of our faces a lot. And these big events have mainstream media covering us. And the storytelling piece that is starting to pick up in women's sports, which is something I'm super passionate about, that's what drives fandom. That's what brings people in. And we talk about things, not just you know, our performance on the field, but we talk about the ways in which you know, society has impacted us. We talk about the ways in which maybe we had hurdles and obstacles to overcome. Not that different from male athletes, but as we all know, the journey of a woman is different. And so because we have the lights on, because we have the microphones in our face, this is going to be the next 10 years, to your point. It's going to be a really great opportunity for the stories of these athletes to be told, because everyone can learn from them. Amazing. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much to all of you for making conversation.